The back and forth rhetoric between North Korea and the United States continues to pile up. Kim Jong un is reportedly reviewing his military's plan to fire missiles near Guam. But he's apparently watching the conduct of the U.S. a little more before making a decision. These pictures from North Korean state media show Kim Jong un reviewing military plans with his generals to launch four missiles near the island of Guam. The North Korean leader decided not to immediately launch his weapons, but did launch another war of words at the U.S. He said, if the Yankees persist in their extremely dangerous, reckless actions on the Korean peninsula, North Korea's military will ring the windpipes and point daggers at their necks. The real threat is a North Korean missile capable of hitting the U.S. After several failed missile tests in 2016, North Korea has now successfully built and launched two intercontinental ballistic missiles, despite heavy international sanctions. To do it so quickly uh, is, is quite astonishing. And Michael means, Elliman is a missile expert who has closely studied North Korea's capabilities for years. He says the regime's sudden advancements mean it received some sort of help. There's just a limited number of countries which actually can produce something of this size and capability. And through a series of uh, deductions and, and elimination of possibilities, you come to either Russia or Ukraine. Elliman believes that the engines used on North Korea's Hwasong missiles, first launched in May, came from a factory in Ukraine and were then likely transported by train through Russia to North Korea. Those missile advancements convinced China, North Korea's main trading partner, to go along with tough new UN sanctions. On Monday, China banned all imports of North Korean coal, iron ore, and seafood. The U.S. has issued a new warning amid the rising tensions with North Korea. Secretary of Defense James Mattis says the U.S. will, quote, take out any missile the North fires toward the U.S. territory of Guam. And Mattis said a North Korean strike on the U.S. could lead to war. That, as the top American military officer was in South Korea. Joint Chiefs Chairman General Joseph Dunford said diplomacy remains the priority. It would be a horrible thing for a war to be uh, conducted here in the peninsula. And that's why we're so focused on, on coming up with a peaceful way ahead to denuclearize the peninsula. Nobody's looking for war. Our job is to make sure that our leadership, both the Korean leadership and the U.S. leadership, have viable military options in the event that deterrence fails. And that's what we're going to deliver. President Moon welcomed General Dunford to Korea and thanked him for his father's service as a U.S. Marine in the Korean War. He then told the general that Pyongyang's accelerating nuclear and missile capability is a serious and real threat to the security of the Korean Peninsula and the region. According to the Blue House, General Dunford emphasized that the mission of U.S. forces... We also have a major development tonight in the showdown with North Korea, the war of words with Kim Jong-un. President Trump promising fire and fury if the North Koreans made any more threats against the U.S. Then North Korea vowing to draft plans to strike near Guam by mid-August. And today, this new message from Kim saying we will watch stupid American behavior a bit longer and warning against extremely dangerous, reckless actions on the Korean Peninsula. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joseph Dunford, talking with our Martha Raddatz, saying the U.S. remains at the ready. What I'd say to Americans today is we have the capability to defend them against the limited attack that North Korea is capable of delivering today. So let's bring in Martha Raddatz from Seoul again tonight. And Martha, that language from North Korea would make it appear they have backed down at least for now. But the Pentagon knows they are still a major threat. Uh, yes, David, it does appear Kim Jong-un blinked and backed away from what very well could have resulted in a major military conflict. But this does not in any way end the threat from this volatile dictator. We know intelligence believes he is trying to perfect a nuclear weapon that could reach the U.S. And as General Dunford told me, military options must remain on the table. One of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joe Dunford, continues his meetings with counterparts in China before he tries travels on to U.S. ally Japan. They have agreed to increase operational communications between China and the United States, especially as it relates to North Korea. Now, China is seen as a key player in getting Kim Jong-un to rein in his bad missile and nuclear programs. It's thought that Beijing's moves to, to cut North Korean imports, as well as some very muscular talk from the White House, has pushed the regime to back off on those threats.
efforts against the U.S. territory Pacific Island of Guam. Still, U.S. troops continue their exercises with Japanese military, and there are plans underway to start bigger maneuvers with South Korean forces next week. Those in particular have gotten Pyongyang angry and have sparked more threats. The U.S. has re been resisting a total cancellation of these exercises, but there are signs that maybe they're going to be tamped down a bit. All involved, though, think that this week's decision to hold back by North Korea could be only temporary. Experts tell us that uh, the regime's supply of hardware, that is, a rocket engines that can fit into these intermediate and long-range missiles, are in plentiful supply. There is some debate on where they're coming from, whether they are Soviet-era rocket engines coming from uh, Russia or Ukraine, or that they're homemade. John, there is no debate, though, that North Korea intends probably to test some more. Back to you. Greg Palcott joining us from London. Greg, thank you. We move on this evening to the sudden illnesses affecting a major airline. For the third time in just a week, crew members on board a JetBlue flight have become sickened. They were taken to the hospital, and this evening, what the airline now says caused this newest case. Here's ABC's David Curley. This jet, the third JetBlue aircraft in a week, there are possibly two patients. In which crew members say they became sick. There's an odor on the plane. We're unsure what it is. Uh, we're around. Two crew members on this Boston to Charleston flight taken to the hospital. JetBlue says in this case, it was nail polish remover that was the odor. But just last Thursday, two JetBlue aircraft were diverted after a half dozen crew members complained of odors in the cabin. And a noxious odor in the aircraft. A business smoky type smell. In one of those incidents, emergency crews in Buffalo administered oxygen. A pilot and two flight attendants taken to the hospital. In both incidents last week, JetBlue says that it followed the manufacturers and the FAA's guidelines in checking out those aircraft, and both jetliners were returned to service. We stand here today at the dawn of a new era in the new world. The United States has always cared deeply about the progress of our neighbors across the Americas. Under President Donald Trump, the United States will always put the security and prosperity of America first. America first does not mean America alone. And the advance of freedom and democracy in Latin America benefits the cause of freedom everywhere. We must build on the bold steps taken by leaders across this region to open new pathways to prosperity for all of our citizens and a greater opportunity for commerce. We must continue to strengthen our collective security by confronting those who threaten our people and our very way of life. We must jealously protect the time-honored values that unite us and stand together to reject all who would discard freedom and democracy for tyranny and dictatorship. And under President Trump, the United States is proud to work with you, shoulder to shoulder and hand in hand, for the benefit of our people.